I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Imaging Scientist. This microcourse is about the chromatic shifts that are often present in light microscopy images. I'm going to cover what chromatic shifts are, when they might be an issue, where they come from, and some of the ways that you can deal with them. Chromatic shifts are of particular concern when imaging more than one color or wavelength, as is the case when using fluorescence microscopy techniques to image specimens labeled with more than one fluorophore. For example, two components in the specimen are labeled with different fluorophores. Images of each fluorophore are acquired sequentially and then merged together computationally to demonstrate the relative localization of the two components. It's simplest to think about the effects of chromatic shifts if we consider a specimen in which the same component is labeled with more than one fluorophore, such that in our example, it fluoresces both green and magenta. In this case, when we merge the images together, it's obvious to expect that we should get perfect co-localization. But this logic requires the assumption that the images of different wavelengths are perfectly coincident. And this is unfortunately most often an incorrect assumption because most microscopes introduce chromatic shifts into images. Chromatic shifts result when images of different wavelengths of light are shifted relative to one another such that the merged image of the specimen does not accurately represent the reality of the specimen. Appreciate the possible misinterpretations of imaging data that chromatic shifts may result in, particularly with co-localization measurements. The simple translation of one image relative to another, as I've shown here, is the type I will address in this microcourse, though more complicated misregistrations are possible as well. These are digital images of a known sample, fluorescent beads that are each labeled with more than one fluorophore. When we merge these together, you can see that in this example, there's a chromatic shift across the entire field of view. Since we know both of the green and magenta fluorophores are attached to the same bead, something has got to be wrong here. Gone undetected, these chromatic shifts may introduce an unacceptable level of error into your measurements. Why do I say may instead of will? That's because the effects of the error on your experiment depends on the size of the labeled object relative to the size of the shift. The size of chromatic shifts can vary quite a bit. Might a chromatic shift be affecting your data? Maybe or maybe not. When imaging objects that are big, relatively small chromatic shifts may not cause a significant change in your measurements. And if imaging with a lower numerical aperture lens, you may not even be able to resolve the shift. In this case, it might not be worth the time and effort to correct for it. In general, as the size of the objects decrease and resolution increases, chromatic shifts tend to become more of a problem. The multicolor fluorescent beads we looked at earlier are just below the resolution limit of this microscope. And if we zoom in on one of the beads, you can see that the size of the bead is roughly the same as the size of the shift. This is an example of when chromatic shift might lead you to the wrong conclusion. So far I've been showing lateral chromatic shifts, but your microscope can also introduce axial chromatic shifts, and most often you'll see a combination of both. I've been showing you lateral chromatic shifts that are revealed when imaging an object labeled with more than one fluorophore. If we collect a series of images at regular intervals along the z-axis, often called a z-series or an image stack, and look at an orthogonal view of the image stack, we can see that the green and magenta images are also shifted axially, such that they appear to be in different focal planes. Side note, if you're not sure why the image of the bead is elongated in the orthogonal view, please check out the point spread function microcourse. If we go back to the lateral view and focus on the green fluorescence and then collect an image of the magenta fluorescence, we'll find that because of the axial shift, magenta will peer out of focus. Now let's go over some of the most common sources of chromatic shifts. Chromatic aberrations in the image forming lenses of the microscope are one possible source. Let's say we use a perfect lens to focus on the image of green fluorescence. On the right, I'm showing a representation of the axial image. If we then collect the corresponding magenta image, the magenta image focuses at the exact same focal plane. Our merged image represents the reality of the specimen, and the green and magenta images co-localize perfectly, 
all is right with the world. However, a perfect lens does not exist. Instead, the majority of microscopes introduce some level of chromatic aberration that causes images of different wavelengths to focus at different planes. To understand why this happens, let's first review refraction and its dependency on wavelength. Consider two media that have different refractive indices, N1 and N2. Refraction occurs to light that is at an oblique angle relative to the perpendicular interface between the two refractive indices and results in light entering the second media at a different angle. The sign of the angle of refraction is given by N1 divided by N2 times the sign of the angle of light as it approaches the interface between the two refractive indices. This is known as Snell's law. Refractive index is defined as the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the media. And this is where wavelength comes in. The speed of light is determined by the frequency times its wavelength. The dependency of refractive index on wavelength is known as dispersion and can be visualized by sending white light through a prism. Lenses use refraction to focus light. And since the angle of refraction depends on wavelength, Simple lenses are subject to chromatic aberration. Optics manufacturers know we prefer this is not going on in our microscopes, so they do the best they can to correct for chromatic aberration. Lenses that are marked APO are highly corrected for chromatic aberration and therefore often the best choice for samples that are labeled with multiple fluorophores. Chromatic aberration correction is achieved in part by adding additional elements to the objective lens. The objective lens shown here was damaged beyond repair, so I asked our machine shop to cut it in half so we can take a look inside. So cool, right? We can see that there is a lot going on inside these lenses, and some of these components help to correct for chromatic aberration. So microscope manufacturers do correct for chromatic aberration, but the correction is not perfect. Every individual lens is different, and I don't mean model of lens here, I mean every individual lens and the correction is optimized for the manufacturer's recommended immersion media. So if you're using a different brand, you may find that chromatic aberration increases. Fluorescence filters are another common cause of chromatic shifts. Fluorescence emission light collected from your specimen travels through multiple filters, namely the dichroic beam splitter and the emission filter. I dig into filter sets more deeply in the fluorescence filters videos, but let's do a quick review. Emission light from your specimen is collected by the objective lens and travels through the microscope where it encounters the dichroic beam splitter, followed by the emission filter. With samples labeled with multiple fluorophores, we then typically change to another filter set to image another fluorophore. Wedge is one of the parameters that's used to define the quality of a filter and is relevant here. Wedge is the parallelism of the outer surfaces of a filter. This emission filter, for example, has no wedge. The top and the bottom of the filter are parallel to one another. This second emission filter has a big old wedge. The top and bottom are not parallel. I've exaggerated the extent of the wedge typically found in filters to make it super obvious. Why does wedge in a filter set matter for chromatic shifts? Once again, it's refraction at work. Filters have a different refractive index than the air that typically surrounds them. When no wedge is present, the light enters and exits the filter at a 90 degree angle relative to the filter surface. Wedge changes the angle of the filter surface relative to the incident light, so refraction occurs. The result here is when wedge varies between filter sets, the difference in angle of refraction results in images with a chromatic shift. Please note, and this is important, each combination of filter sets will result in a different shift. This means that if, for example, you're imaging magenta and green, you'll see one shift, but if you pair the same green filter with a different filter, your shift will change. There are other potential but less common sources of chromatic aberration that include microscopes equipped with multiple cameras or image splitting devices and choice of immersion media. With all of these potential sources, it's best practice to assume that your imaging system introduces chromatic shifts into your images until you demonstrate it doesn't. So what can you do about chromatic shifts? 
Chromatic shifts are most often systematic errors. Systematic errors are errors that are consistent and repeatable. This means chromatic shifts can be carefully measured and corrected in your images. So you're going to need to measure the shift, make sure that the shift is the same each time, and then correct for it. Because chromatic shifts have several different sources, it's best not to take any chances. Measure chromatic shifts using the same exact microscope hardware you use for your experiments. To measure the shift, you'll need a known specimen in which the same component is labeled with multiple fluorophores. One option is to label one of your own specimens in this way, say by using a mix of two or more different secondary antibodies with a single primary antibody and your standard specimen mounting conditions. This type of specimen, because of its similarity to your experimental specimen, may yield the most accurate measurement. Alternatively, you can purchase small beads that fluoresce in multiple wavelengths. To measure the shift, you'll take images of the test sample at each wavelength that you plan to use for your experiment. For the shift correction to work, the shift must be repeatable. To determine if it is, you'll need to take multiple images of the same field of view going back and forth between wavelengths. This will reveal if the shift is repeatable. You can use the same sample to measure axial chromatic shifts. This requires collecting multiple Z-series, or image stacks, of the same field of view, so you can measure the shift in the orthogonal view. After you've collected images of the shift, you'll need to measure it. Free and open source analysis software, such as ImageJ, Fiji, and Apari, can be used for this purpose. Instructions on how to use these software are easy to find online, and if you have questions, you can ask the image analysis experts on the image.sc discussion forum. To register the images, you'll transform one relative to the other, which can also be done in the open source software packages previously mentioned. You'll find that these software offer multiple options for performing this correction. The best option depends on the extent of the misregistration between your images. If your measurement and the correction of the shift is accurate, the merged corrected images should now co-localize. But you're not done yet. Applying the correction to the same images you use to measure it is pretty darn likely to work. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong in the process of measuring chromatic shift, so you must validate your measurements. And you should do so on a different set of images than the ones you use to measure the shift. It's also good practice to repeat the measurements on different days to make sure it's consistent over time as well. To validate, you can, for example, measure the change in co-localization in your test specimen before and after the correction is applied, which I've done here using a correlation coefficient. You can see that in this example, co-localization between green and magenta intensity values improved after the shift correction was applied. Now let's go over some of the things that can go wrong when measuring chromatic shifts. Movement of the specimen as images are acquired is a common source of irreproducibility in chromatic shift measurements. Best practice is to place your specimen securely on the microscope stage and then give it some time to settle. 10 minutes of settling time is usually sufficient to reduce specimen drift, but you may find your setup needs even more time. It's also best practice when collecting a Z-series to set up the focus motor to move against gravity. On most instruments, this will result in more accurate intervals between images in the Z-series. The option to change the focus motor direction is available in most image acquisition software. You should also collect sets of images of each wavelength at each focal plane, like this, rather than taking all of one wavelength and then all of the next. When collected this way, drift and inaccuracy in the focus motor can exaggerate chromatic shifts and make them irreproducible. If you need to correct for chromatic aberration in live specimens, you might not be able to get away with collecting a Z-series at every time point. In this case, you can take another approach. Correct for axial chromatic shifts by changing focus between acquisition of each wavelength. Most image acquisition software can be set up to move the focus motor between images. This allows you to focus on one wavelength, change to the next wavelength, move the focus motor by the measured axial shift, and then acquire the next image. If you have questions about this topic or any of the microcourses, 
please feel free to post them on Microforum, where you can find microscopists who are happy to help. Forum.microlist.org. I hope this microcourse has convinced you to check for chromatic shifts in your microscope and correct for them whenever they may compromise the accuracy of your data.